All right, so in this video, what I'd like to do is just kind of go through the things that we have learned and we have gone through um, for this uh, for this chapter, so then for next, when you guys go through your uh, go through your summary, you guys have all the information that you know, right? When you guys do your uh, uh, your um, review, you'll have all the information you need to know. So the first thing I want to talk about is what exactly. Remember, we talked about a vector. So we came back through a vector with two coordinate points, x1, x2. Actually, well, let's call this y1, and then we had x2, y2. Right? So the first thing I introduced you guys with vectors was really, it's just like two coordinate points connected, but it's what we call a directed line segment, meaning that one of the points is initial and one of the points is terminal, right? One you start at, one you end at. All right? Now, the problem came in is once we said, hey, this is a directed line segment, it has a direction. And if you guys remember direction in starting chapter four, you know, your Miranda's 30 degrees could be very different than what Brittany thinks of 30 degrees. But now that we've talked about the standard form of 30 degrees, right? they would probably draw the same 30 degree angle if I said draw 30 degree angles. But at the beginning, 30 degrees could have been represented many different ways. So even though this is where our vectors came from, we wanted to standardize this. So to do that, we came up with, oh, and let's, let's call these two points P and Q. All right, so those two points P and Q. So to do that, what we came up with was Component form. And component form looks like this. Uh, x2 minus x1, comma, y2 minus y1. Okay? So component form was pretty much essentially the distances and the change of those. So this is what we came up with our component form. And what was nice about component form is that the initial point is always at 0. And we changed these two to write this as v equals v1 comma v2, right? So we changed it to now represent, instead of writing it as pq, we gave the vector a name. Instead of giving it the name of the two points, we gave it a name like v, and we wrote that the difference of your uh, x coordinates and your y coordinates as v1, v2, all right? And that, whoa, whoa, oh, man. seriously? OK. So that was our vector. That was like the start of a vector, right? And then we learn, all right, well, there's a couple things we could do with the vector. First thing we could do with the vector is find the magnitude of the vector. To find the magnitude of the vector, which was v1 squared plus v2 squared. And remember, magnitude gave you the distance, the, uh, the length of that uh, vector. The next important thing that we learned to do was, as I mentioned, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2. The next important thing that we learned to do was find the unit vector. So when we talked about, what am I doing? Um, so here's what a vector would look like in component form. What we next talked about was how to find the unit vector. And we didn't really get too much into the unit vector, but I'm going to explain again today why, we, why that unit vector is so important to our understanding. So the next thing we did was find the unit vector. Remember, the unit vector was a vector that was in the same direction. But so if this is v, that vector was u, which we called the unit vector. It's the exact same vector, or same direction, but has now a magnitude only of 1. So how did you find the unit vector? Again, this was your homework quiz, remember. All you simply do is take v over the magnitude of v. Okay? And, I want, and I'm going to say this. I'm going to stress this really quickly. We take the vector and divide it by its magnitude. Divide it by its magnitude. I'll go back into that in a second. So let's actually examine then a little bit back into the unit circle. So let's take a look at a unit vector. Okay? What was so important about a unit vector was that when we had a unit vector, and actually, let me go back through a quick little review for you guys. Let's do this over here. I'll erase this, but I want you guys to write this down. Ooh, well, there was actually a couple other things I wanted to talk about. 
when we had this unit vector, remember we had two other vectors? This was our unit vector i, and that was our unit vector j, right? So we could rewrite all vectors in terms of i's and j's, which gave us another component, which was v1i plus v2j. We'll, we'll talk about more about that in a second. But so let's go back into this. Let's look at this angle right here. Let's look at 30 degrees, OK? Um, Dun, 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 dun. Michael, what's the point for 30 degrees on the unit circle? Awesome. OK. What that represents is of this triangle, this distance is um, 1 half. This distance is square root of 3 over 2. Would everybody agree with me on that assessment? That's how we got those points using special right triangles, OK? Now, this represents a coordinate point, right? But if I wanted to represent this as a vector, then the points are the same, but now we use the uh, pointed parentheses. Would everybody agree with me? OK? Now, what's nice about the unit circle is if I can find a point that's on the unit circle, why we use this unit circle is now what I can do is I can understand that when there's a point on the unit circle, I can rewrite it in terms of sines and cosines. Because let's look at it. If I rewrote this as cosine of 30 degrees, comma, the sine of 30 degrees, would everybody say that the cosine of 30 degrees, the sine of 30 degrees is the exact same thing as the square root of 3 over 2, comma, 1 half? Is it the exact same thing? Yes. So what's important for us to understand is that a unit circle or vectors on the unit circle can be represented in terms of cosines of the angle and sines of the angle. So the next thing that you can write is for your vectors, not only can you write them as a linear combination of their coordinate points of their terminal point, we can also write them as a linear combination of their angles. So I can now write this as cosine of theta i plus sine of theta j. All right? But the problem right this is right now, that only gives us a vector that's on the unit circle. What if I wanted to represent a vector that's not on the unit circle? Well, again, let's think about this. If it's not on the unit circle, to find it on the unit circle, we divide it by its magnitude. So if we can write it in terms of on the unit circle, but we want to write it off the unit circle, we'll have to do what by its magnitude? Multiply, right? You're just doing the opposite. So therefore, if we're given a vector in terms of its magnitude and angle, I can now multiply by the magnitude of that vector. Does that kind of make a little sense? Anybody have any questions on that? This is all like the important stuff, all the formulas and stuff you'll need to know. A lot of crazy stuff. Any questions? Anything else? Good? OK, so we're not done yet, I don't think. No, yeah. That's like the summary of what we learned. I'm just going to teach you guys three different new things that we're going to talk about. Um, but as far as what we've been able to do, this was, oh, wait, no, we're not done yet. Um, the last thing I want to talk about was, again, what if actually I wanted to find the theta, right, the actual angle? What if I want to find the angle of that? Well, again, to find the angle, you have to do the opposite over your adjacent. So you have to take the opposite right, over your x. Or in this case, it'd be v1 and v2. So the last thing we need to talk about was how to find the angle, which would be tangent of theta equals v2 over v1. All right. So that's so far in this class, this is everything that we've talked about and how to apply it. We have multiple different ways to represent vectors. Right. We can find the magnitude, which is the length. We can rewrite it in terms of unit vectors. And then we're going to learn a couple more things um, based on that uh, stuff here and just now. And then we'll 